The vision behind Vita is providing an affordable, safe, clean place where people are proud to live and help them get ahead in life. Hello, and welcome to Sink or Swim, a weekly podcast brought to you by RentSync, where we take a deep dive into the prop tech, multifamily, and rental housing industry. In each episode, we uncover the technologies and strategies used to help overcome operational challenges and increase the value of your multifamily investments. So let's get into our conversation today. All right, welcome back to another episode of Sink or Swim. I'm your host today, Matt Hildebrand, Marketing Manager here at Rensync. Joining us today is Ron Lovett, Founder and Chief Community Officer at Vita. Vita has over 2,000 units across Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Manitoba, and is raising the standard of attainable rental accommodation in Canada. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Excited to jump into a thoughtful conversation. <laughs> Likewise. So for those unfamiliar with Ron, he's an entrepreneur, an author, and even hosts a podcast of his own, Scaling Culture, with Ron Lovett. So before we get into some of our topics today, Ron, I know a bit about your story and your journey, but why don't you let the listeners know a bit about yourself, your past experience, and really what led you to found Vita? Sure. Yeah. And I have to say, the podcast title, a little intimidating. I'm like, am I going to be in the... Do you classify your speakers as you're sinking or you're swimming? How does that work? Or is this just a fun... We'll grade you at the end. Grade me? Okay, good. Well, I hope I'm not sinking. So, uh, yeah, look, born and raised in Halifax, Nova Scotia, one of the best places on the world in the world. For those listening, if, if you haven't visited Halifax, put on your bucket list. I guess a bit of a serial entrepreneur. And what I mean by that is I was just in a bunch of different businesses. So my, my initial business was physical guarding. So I started doing nightclubs here in Halifax when I was 21. So I used to run most of the nightclubs, 80, 90% of the nightclubs here. Got into festivals, concerts. At the same point, opened Halifax's first bring your own bottle of wine restaurant called Milano's. And then next opened up a restaurant called Noodle Nook, which was like a bento takeout, you know, noodle place. I also had a construction company. So I was I was really all over the map. And I'll say, you know, just just all over the map as far as my entrepreneur career was going and, and very unfocused. And I paid for that, by the way, you know, because I certainly wasn't well capitalized. You know, so I was spread very thin and I was doing a bunch of things not very well. And that was challenging. I think that showed up because I was so unfocused. So, so what I mean by that is none of the businesses were doing that great. And then so it hit a low point where the security business really started to struggle. And I ended up winding down and selling off the other businesses and refocusing on the security company. And that, that was quite helpful. But it was still challenging. It's still within like, – so, so it was interesting – I was unfocused outside of the business, but then even when I had one business, I was unfocused within the business. And what I mean by that is I could be on tour with Jay-Z or, or providing security for Nicole Kidman for Toronto Film Fest, or we could do the Rolling Stones concert in Moncton for 400 security guards, or do security for a high school dance, or if Starbucks window broke, we'd send a guard over. So, just very unfocused. And, and that also, I paid for that. In 2015, maybe mid-14, I lost a million dollars. I was a sole shareholder and I was underwater about a million bucks. Very stressful time. You know, I was lucky. I hit a big question. That big question to me at the time was what if I had to restart the private security industry? And that was a great question. That allowed me to go back to the drawing board, start from scratch. And the two things that came out of that, Matt, were could I create real culture in a command and control environment? where it was command and control, old, you know, old culture, there wasn't really any robust or progressive cultures in private security. So that was one thing. And the second was, could I decentralize, move all the mid-level management out where all of the decisions went to die? And could I push all the decisions down to front lines? Anyways, that really helped. I turned the company around. We grew 60% two years in a row and then, and then exited for 24 times multiple to a California company. So that was great. Had my first child at the time, wrote a book, 2018, called Outrageous Empowerment, the incredible story of giving employees their brains back. Not that they didn't have brains, but the industry had kind of taken it from them. And we were looking to give it back to everybody or tap into their collective brain power, which which worked well. So from there, and, I, and by the way, I have three kids now. So I've got three kids under six. Georgia is now six years old. So it took a year and was trying to figure out what to do. And I was just telling the story of a coffee, you know, every entrepreneur and advisor told me to not do anything for two years, you know, just sit tight, hold your money to do whatever you're going to do, think, but don't do anything for two years. 
And then there was a hundred unit portfolio that came up in Halifax in a very challenging area. These were condemned buildings. Some of these were completely vacant. Police had, had condemned them or, or the Halifax Regional Municipality with the police just got everybody out. And so BMO had the debt. I was going to take these 100 units over and it was going to be really challenging to turn them around. And it was a complex deal. And I went to one of my mentors and I said, hey, this guy, John Risley, fantastic guy. If you haven't heard of John, you should Google him. And John said to me, I said, John, you know, everyone says not to do a deal for two years. Don't, don't do anything for two years. And John said, you know, I don't agree. He said, I think the best time to do a deal is when you don't need to do a deal. And what he meant by that is, you know, once you're in a business, there's pressure to grow the business. There's pressure to get more customers, even if it, with terms you don't like. And, but without having any business, uh, you could get the terms you wanted and it could work for you. So I really liked that advice. And I went ahead and acquired that hundred units, started to pilot things that, that I thought would be helpful. Because when I looked at the sector, I really saw three ownership groups. I saw slumlords, like who I bought these from. I saw entrepreneurs and small families that were good people, kept their word, good operators, but, but not innovative, no real strategy and no data-driven decisions. And then I saw institutional owners and publicly traded companies that in most cases, third party to management, but, but because of the pressure from shareholders in most cases would just say, hey, drive rents up as high as you can. And, and the strategy was, yeah, drive rents as high as you can and lower costs as, as much as possible. So I thought, you know, you go back to that book, The Blue Ocean Strategy, can you find that blue ocean? And I kind of thought, you know, maybe it's there. Maybe it's right there where we'll, you know, go in and just stay in workforce housing. I hadn't seen anyone own that at this point and create a brand around it and really connect with those customers to create a sense of belonging and community that nobody was doing. And then I want to create a brand and, and the Vita brand was born, which is the Spanish word for lifetime. And so I've been doing that for just over four years and we're having a ball. A lot to unpack there, kind of buried the lead there. I'd love to have you back on and talk about your experiences with Jay-Z and Nicole Kidman. But There you go. <laughs> we are a multifamily, so keep it on Vita there. Kind of answered one of my questions I had, and that was what brought you to this industry? Probably one of the only people I've met that's gone from securities to <laughs> rental housing. So really, it was that opportunity, like you said, that kind of came about and you seized it. Other well, than that, was... Was there there's anything a, passionate? Or sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, there's a, there are two other things that connected me to what I'll call workforce housing, that affordable sector. Because really, that we're talking about the 70s, 80s, early 90s, wood frame buildings from four-story, 12 to 100 units, let's call it. And, you know, when I was leaving the security industry, two things. I had also asked the same question in workforce housing, like, what if you had to restart this industry from scratch? And that allowed me to kind of look at back to the blue ocean, kind of, you know, connect to the customers, create community. That was the answer for me. And then also what made it easier was I was reading a book. It was a co-author with Jim Collins. I forget the name of the book, but, but essentially it was talking about, you know, this concept of P squared. And if you could mix together what you're passionate about and your purpose, then you're in the right space. You won't leave. And so I knew at that point that I was passionate about flipping an industry on its head. We were doing that in private security with, with decentralization culture. That was very different. And I thought this industry is prime for that. We could do everything different, you know, because it's stale, it's old, you know, and, and the second piece is I'm passionate about helping people. I really love to fight for the underdog, help them get ahead. And, and I thought, yeah, these things are coming together. It felt really right for chapter two for me. And, and yeah, it's, it's, I haven't looked back since. That's great. Now, I'm going to ask you a little bit later on about maybe some of your expansion plans, but did you really set out? I know you've kind of grown out west a little bit as we speak now. Yeah. Was your goal to really keep it local? Like you felt passionate about that specific industry or did you really kind of look at it as a whole Canadian issue? Well, you know, interesting. I see it as a global issue and I saw this as a global company. You know, our first BHAG by 2027 was we'll hit 10,000 units, but that's, I'm sure that this company will have hundreds of thousands of units and I'm very confident it'll be a global brand. And so I didn't just see this as a Canadian problem. And there's still questions about, you know, Winnipeg. It was not in our backyard. And, and I still debate this with people. We've got assets there. You know, it's tougher. It's tougher. It's a tougher market 
than the East Coast. It's got higher vacancy, tougher social economical problems. It's got a lot more challenging regulations with the Tenancy Board and, and Resident Tenancy Act. But, you know, to me, I look at that market and this is my answer why we expanded there. It reminds me of back in the day, and I'll come back to Winnipeg, but it reminds me of when I expanded the security company, we went from Halifax to, to literally Vancouver before Toronto. And I said, why'd you do that? Different business culture, time zone changes, you know, all these things. And I always thought, if I can get Vancouver right, then everything else gets easier. And so we looked at that as Winnipeg and it's more challenging. And, you know, just lately we've had to put more focus on that market. And I always think if we can't get that market right, then we have no business to be a global company. And so we're not going to fail. We'll get it right. So I like, I kind of like taking the tough stuff. It, look, it's, it can be draining sometimes. It's two steps forward, three steps back, but we learn a lot. You learn, and I've learned this in business, you get lazy when things are good. You can't afford to be lazy when things are tough. And so you can't be lazy in Winnipeg. You get lazy and it shows up pretty quickly. We've been hit a few times and you can't take things for granted. You need to work for it. And that's okay. I think that's how you build a great company. I love that taking on the challenges there. Now, earlier, you touched on a few other things I'd love to get into, decentralization, building a brand, but keeping on Vita just for a little bit more, I think it'll segue into it. Vita's purpose is really to revolutionize affordable communities. Why don't you take us a little bit through Vita's innovative business model, the four pillars, and how they help achieve this goal? Yeah, sure. So we have, as a company, we have core values, but we have pillars in the business. So our pillars, these were created through pilots in the early stages of what was critically important to this customer, the missing middle, I'll call it. And the four things that seem to be quite important outside of affordability. So, okay, fine. If you're going to be affordable to that, that customer, which to us is 20 to 30% under market. So four things. You need a safety and security is critical because people will not have confidence of where they live. So that was, that's one of our pillars. Cleanliness. If your building's not clean inside out, they will not have a sense of pride. It needs to be clean. The next was community. That one is very broad. We do a few things by community. The most challenging thing we do is actually being very innovative and creative on the space inside that building. Because for those who are listening, you know that a 12-unit or 20-unit wood frame building doesn't have a bowling alley and a, and a movie theater and a pool. So you do need to be creative. And so if there's storage in the basement, you know, we'll get rid of that and we'll put a gym down there. We'll convert a one bedroom to a bachelor to put a common area in. So we have to be very creative. If there's extra room and it's not a fire hazard on the third floor, we'll put a working station and a library with a book exchange. So very creative on that. And then, you know, other things to build community too, community events and, and things like that, which are, are very important. We have lots of community partners. This also goes to opportunity, providing discounts to our customers. And opportunity is the last pillar. That sounds unorthodox, but as I had done in my last business, when I removed the mid-level management, we started to what I called insource small projects to security guards. So if someone in the accounting department was being bogged down through bank racks, we would outsource that or insource, sorry, to a, you know, an ex-CFO that was a, from India that was working for us in Burnaby, BC, just pressing a button, letting trucks in a large facility all day. What a horrible use of their time and brain, not time maybe, but brain. And so we're running the same play with, with our customers. So in the opportunity side, we give our customers first right of refusal on small repair and maintenance projects, as well as company projects. They get involved with Vita. Robert Afari, if, if you're listening, we're really excited to have you on board. Robert, who we just hired a full-time sales role, who was one of our customers, had done some projects for us, done some video. He's, he's a really creative individual. And we went to market with a, with a sales role. And so one of our customers is coming on to work for us full time. And that's not the first time this has happened. We have a few people in the office that started off doing projects and now, now a full-time job. So at the end of the day, the idea, the vision behind Vita is providing an affordable, safe, clean place where people are proud to live and help them get ahead in life. And so, you know, you can do that. You can do that through opportunity, community, and sense of belonging. And it's fun. Look, it's not easy. We have some tough days 
we are in uncharted territory, so we're not following a playbook. You know, there's all kinds of books on how to manage real estate, do property management, not with what we're doing. We start, you know, from pilot stage and make mistakes. We refine and get it right and then move. Especially after the year we had, 2022, recording this January 13th, so new year, trying to put 2022 behind us. So yeah, definitely roller coaster of a year. So kind of going off of what you just said there about you know, empowering and giving some of your residents jobs, inflation has been a hot button subject over the past few months. I know within your business model you just touched on, you really add value to your assets by you know improving curb appeal, security, common areas you like you just mentioned. You don't really strip down to the studs. Yeah. So what are some ways really Vita has kind of combated inflation? And has anything had to shift within your existing model? Yeah, yeah, great question. So a few things. One, I'll say being an impact brand, we're the S in the ESG, you can gain some leverage. We get some discounts and deals that companies that large REITs don't get. And it's because we're not just capitalists. We're not a nonprofit. We're for profit. But doing the right thing for the customer, people can really get behind that. And we'll help tell their story and how they've impacted the customer. And, and so that's one piece that has been helpful to us. The second piece really, you know, it's, it's interesting. So in our application process, we ask people, what are your hard and soft skills? I, I am a painter and I like to do customer service calls. But with our business, we get that information when someone comes in through the Vita platform. But if you think about how quickly we've scaled, we acquire customers. And so we don't have that information. So we try our best to get it, but we, it's not black and white for us. And so what we started to do to combat inflation and, and two things, we started to move some roles in-house, right? So obviously you have some volume, you start to bring some of these roles in-house, you, you analyze your financial information, say, wow, we think we can be more efficient, it's going to have a lower cost. So we just brought on a gentleman by the name Patrick Locke. He's just joined us. He used to work security for me. Now he's he's actually our security manager and, and he'll manage our security program. So that, that's exciting. And we're now starting to run skill building programs to create what we're calling community contractors. So I'm just going to pick on painting because it's probably the most common R&M item on our P&L. And so from a repair maintenance standpoint, just painting we do it more than anything. And so let's just say that a contractor is going to charge us $1,000 to paint a one bedroom. Well, we'll tap into the community. And now when I, from a skill building standpoint, we'll actually, we're creating courses, which is face-to-face -face, as well as some online content to create what we're calling community contractors, where people would be approved by our skill building team to come in and, and paint and and we'll get that for 65 cents on the dollar and and the customer who's doing that is quite happy as well we're recycling capital they're whether they're putting that money towards a vacation car payment rent it doesn't matter it's they'll do this you know on the side on the weekends or after hours and so that's going quite well we're really building that out now which is exciting to me because we can build skills for emergency things that just get in people's way or the the common repair and maintenance projects that happen. So it's really exciting, you know, to be able to take a, a new immigrant, provide that type of training for them because there's a lack of skills and lack of contractors in some cases. Or, you know, you whether it's a single parent or an elderly person looking to get back in the workforce. And so it's great. We are going to double down on that strategy, whether, you know, whether inflation continues or not. So now all these people are certified, licensed. So that's how you're kind of mitigating risk with some of these things. Because I can hear people thinking, you know, what if they fall? What if whose responsibility is that? Or do yeah. you need boots on the ground to kind of keep an eye on these people? Yeah. So look, we check and balance things. They're not light, like from a compliance standpoint, probably maybe in the US there's a place like this, but here in Canada, you don't need to be a licensed painter or to put caulking on a baseboard. Because a lot of these things, you know, we use third party contractors to lay floors and do different things redo a kitchen or update kitchen cupboards. We aren't using like you, you've got, you've got some liability. We, we certainly don't use this for repairing roofs or changing bathtubs or sure. windows. Right. And so if there's safety and warranty, we're, we're quite careful and we use third party contractors, but, but yeah, like people would look at that and say, yeah, can't someone slip and fall in their painting? Yes, they can. We do treat it as a third party contractor. So no different than I guess my question you, Matt, is if if you needed someone to paint your garage, you went on Facebook and people suggested three or four people that can do it, 
you're probably not even going to the stage like we are, which is having them sign some paperwork to take responsibility, to make sure that they claim their own income for CRA, et cetera. You're probably just having to go in and you're going to eat transfer some cash, right? So that's essentially, we've taken that kind of gig economy model, but formalized and create process around it to, to protect the business. I love it. And like you said, you're doubling down on it. So it's part of your expansion plans. Do you see this plan also working in other markets, Toronto and Vancouver, it's going to kind of be part of your core business model moving forward? I don't know if someone could convince me that this wouldn't work globally. I got back from Nigeria just over a month ago and we were looking at some stuff in Abuja. You couldn't convince me it wouldn't work there, you know, as far as skill building and helping people that then, if you think about it, you live in the building, you've painted a unit, you're proud of the work you've done, you have a sense of pride, sense of ownership, you're going to, a new customer moves in, you're going to be like, hey, Matt, I, it's Ron. I, I, yeah, I don't know if you knew this, but I painted your unit. Did you like it? Like, you know, it's a conversation. Now we go have a coffee. Like, there's all these things that happen from that outside of the transaction of I got paid to paint your unit. Like what you hear so far? Make sure you never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. Now let's get back to the show. You mentioned something a little bit earlier, how you get this customer data through the Vita platform. But when you acquire buildings, there's a bit of a, a data hole there. Yeah. How have you found that the Vita brand, when we're talking about brands, has really resonated in the area? And are you almost seeing residents kind of excited that it's now a Vita building and are kind of jumping two feet in? Or are you still kind of working towards that? Yeah, there's a, it's a great question. I don't have a single answer. So I'll say this, you know, we have an incredible lady by the name of Sandra Wilson. She's a building ambassador at one of our buildings, but she's also helps us in the office with accounts receivable. And so she, you know, started as we acquired her building. She was a customer, became building ambassador, and then did some small project. Now she's full time. One of those great stories. Anyhow, you know, I go back to a story of when I was touring the building and she was the superintendent of the building. And so we walked in, of course, you pretend you're like with the insurance company because nobody wants to say it's for sale. And I walked in and she just, her eyes and her eyes lit up and she had a smile, you know, ear to ear. She had read some media stuff and was like, ah, Vita bought it. This is great. And she was really excited. Now, that was probably because of some research she had done. The brand is still growing. So, I think in some cases, people are quite excited. Other people don't give a damn. They just don't care. In some new markets, you know, it's going to take us longer. I'll go back to Winnipeg. The brand is not as strong as it is here. We haven't had the same media attention. You know, we our strategy is is media and turn customers into fans. You know, and people know this business. They know that it's landlord versus tenant, and it's unfortunate. We started with business and customer and moving towards like co stakeholders that are in this thing together and creating fans for for marketing purposes. So. That takes some time, you know, and as we expand that, that is going to continue to be a challenge for us. We have to continue to strategize. How do we get the brand out there as fast as we can? How do we get the message to these acquired customers about who we are as fast as we can? And yeah, we'll keep working on it. I don't want you to give away any company secrets. Or what are some of the steps you've been taking to kind of grow that brand? Maybe outside of your conventional, you know, social media, things yeah. like that. Yeah. So look, we do, you know, again, you know, kind of three things from a marketing standpoint. It's win, win with the media, like get out there and, and get the media to tell our story. Customers into fans, which is is really critical and just telling our story. And so, one of the best strategies we have is, is one called newsjacking. And so, essentially what will happen is if there's a story that hits and someone's written a story about how a customer in a workforce housing asset was mistreated or there was a major lack of security and this happened. If it's something that we do the opposite or that our business solves, we'll reach out to the reporter and say, hey, great story, Matt. We read your story. Love that story. We actually solve that problem and we think your readers would like to hear about that. And boom, we will hijack. It's called Newsjack. David Meerman Scott, who's a great marketer in the US, coined this. And I learned it from him. And we'll jack the story. And then sometimes another media outlet will pick that up and say, oh, they'll read from, you know what's happened. You, you go online right now and you're reading the same article in 15 different news places, right? So they just keep taking the story. Ours, we don't get that type of attention sometimes, but we certainly will have other media outlets pick it up. So that's been quite helpful. 
that newsjacking really gets us immediate attention and, and, and that's helpful. I love that newsjacking. I haven't heard that term yeah. exactly, but uh, it sounds quite interesting. Might have to jack it for rent sync. There you go. <laughs> Should be thinking about that. So kind of going back a little bit there, you talked about the idea of empowering brand ambassadors, scaling, building culture, building a brand kind of as you expand, just to go behind the office door for a minute. How are you approaching kind of the challenge of centralization, decentralization? I know you touched on your security business there of mm-hmm. decentralizing and it yeah. brought in massive success for you. How are you kind of approaching that as the brand's growing, as the business is growing, as you're bringing on kind of more employees and building ambassadors? How are you really looking at that idea of centralization versus decentralization? Yeah. So constantly looking at different processes and are we ready? You know, we'll sometimes build something from a centralized standpoint and then decentralize it. But, you know, in a perfect world, everything will be decentralized, but we'll build the system with the right stakeholders. So we build it with the front lines to make sure it works for them. They're the really customer here. So we build the framework, the support the checks and balance, the training, and then we push it out to the front line. So a great example of that would be our building ambassadors, in some cases, either we find another customer that will clean the building or the building ambassador do it themselves. And so when we first started the business, from a centralized standpoint, we either provided them the cleaning supply, they had to come pick it up, or sometimes we would ship it to them and and here's what we would give them. And really this was getting too clunky. We had some people that had cars, some people that didn't, some people had cash to buy stuff, some people didn't, they were buying different products all over the map. So we now drop ship through Amazon. It's just, we, there's these eight items and they can drop ship and it sends to them directly. So we have a relationship with Amazon. We pick the products, we procure the products, we tell them about the products, we have training about how to use everything through Avita University, but they can order direct. And so we're out of the way. And so that's a great example. You know, we, I think about this all the time when it comes to building supplies. I think a lot of companies, they scale and they say, oh, it's time to, to look internationally for, well, we're going to start buying our paint from China, or we're going to buy our hardwood floor from wherever, or, or laminate. But that comes with other problems. You do that, you have to store it. You're kind of an asset manager now. You need to have vehicles to ship it you know, the warehouses, keep the inventory. It causes other problems that sometimes you don't see at first glance. So we also like to support local business. So from a decentralized standpoint, we've said, look, we'd rather our folks locally have a a relationship with a local hardware store and and they get a phone call from Larry, the salesperson on Thursday to say that laminate floor is on sale and it's the last box. We also know that our customers don't care. Matt, if you and I are neighbors in one of our units, and we meet in the hallway and I come over to your place for coffee and you come over to my place the next day for coffee and your laminate is dark brown and mine is a lighter color. No one gives a shit. Like just don't care. And so I think we get caught into what aspects of the brand are really important. Like a sign, that that's quite important. You want to be pretty consistent with the brand and the sign outside the building. But do you need that for the, the floors inside? And by the way, I understand that developers, value adders, they're, they're buying stuff in bulk and, and, and that strategy works for some, just not working for us. And so we've taken a different approach. So we don't have to worry about, we give the local folks the autonomy, make those decisions, build those relationships, support the local businesses, and it's working for us. We're going to keep doing that. Ron, I've got a bit of a loaded question kind of coming up for you here. Like I said, it's recording this January 13th. 2022 was an interesting year for the rental industry. You know, we saw demand hit all time highs in early 2022. We saw interest rates spike in late 2022. With Vita having maybe not your conventional model, maybe take us through a little bit about how Vita navigated the past year. And I know you're kind of newer to the industry. Yeah. Did you learn anything? Kind of what are your takeaways? Yeah, I guess high, high level because I hadn't been through a cycle and I'm new to the industry. I, I have more questions. Then I have answers. I, I, you know, I was really lucky because when all this was starting to happen, I was on paternity leave. I know that sounds crazy, but you know, to take five months off, I took five months off with my daughter Margot from April to September. But it was probably the best thing for the business and for me. And what I mean by that is because I was home with my daughter, I wasn't in the office, I wasn't in meetings. But she was napping twice a day, and I would just call really smart people and say, "What are you thinking? What are you? What are you hearing? What are you seeing?" 
And that was, I was really educated and got to get a very broad spectrum of what was going on. What I was seeing is, is during that time, all these changes can be noise, right? They can be noise. And you turn focus on to a lot of that noise. Oh, what are rates going to be? What is, this is crystal ball questions. This is just, stu- they're, stu- they're actually stupid questions in some cases because you don't have the answer. And I don't care how smart someone is, they don't have the answer either. And so I just think, you know, we would get caught sometimes just debating these things. And, and we just say, look, let's just get all this. Uh, the question for us became, are you going to take out now or you know, hold on to your cheaper debt before you refi at a higher rate, blah, blah, blah. And I remember talking to some bankers. They said, well, the question is, you know, what do you think rates are going to be in two years? And I say, stupid question. Nobody knows the answer. The question is, the rate as it stands, the CMHC 10-year rate, is the property cash flowing at that rate? If it is, take the market risk off the table. Take it off the table. Move. And so, we refied a lot of our assets. We've got a very small chunk left to go. And so, I'd say, you know, those were two things that I thought about. And then the last thing I'll say is, When things like that happen, you see three categories of business owners or real estate owners, I guess, whatever you want to call it in in this space. And one, people are panicked. That's a bad place to be. They're panicking. They're freaking out. They make bad decisions. You have another group that don't really know what's going on. That could almost be worse than panicking. Panic, you know too much, right? You've overthought it. You're freaking out. You're emotional. Not knowing enough, you're not asking any questions. Ah, it's just business as usual. No, it's not. No, it's not. You should be asking lots of questions and thinking about it. So those two categories are not good. And then the steady, just to be in the middle, just just stay the course and keep moving forward with your strategy, but understanding what's going on and strategizing around that, but not panicking and not not knowing anything. I love that. I think we were both in uh, September there at the Toronto Apartment Investment Conference and you could almost feel the panic in the air. Right. But some people, people are watching their phone, waiting to see what the next interest rate hike was. Not collaborating, just kind of panicking and waiting for the shoe to drop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was interesting. And so, and look, I'm still learning a lot about that. And But I go back to, you know, what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, what can you do? You can't do anything about some of that stuff. What can you do? And that's where where if you're in the middle, you're going to focus. Like, and sometimes that's outside, outside of just refinancing or selling an asset. That could be what can you do within your business? And, you know, we've just talked about some of those strategies of us on our skill building model, you know? So we try to focus on what we can do. We're, we're exploring potentially creating our own captive insurance. You know, that's something we can do. And so I think times like these, if you ran your business, especially with the pandemic, you know, I'll actually say during the pandemic, cause that was even, you know, created more chaos. People were pivoting, starting, stopping, you know, you name it, but it's an opportunity, right? Like these times are an opportunity to, to be thoughtful, get educated, and be very strategic. If you're the same company entering the pandemic as you were towards the end or now, I think you really lost an opportunity. And all aspects, your systems, your process, your people, your strategy, you know, it was a great time to go back to the drawing board. That's a great segue into my next question there. We want to put 2022 behind us, new year. What are you kind of looking forward to this year? Looking at like expansion, you know, you just touched on the insurance there, you know, coming out of this year, like, What are you excited about for 2023? Yeah, I think a few things. Excited to double down our strategy on on the skill building for sure and and systemizing that in the in so we're piloting things. We've used some suppliers to help us, but really building the internal resources in person online. Very exciting to me. Excited to continue to really strategize and, and execute and be efficient in markets like Winnipeg. I'm mean, really excited. This is, it's, it's hard work there and I'm excited about that. Excited to look at US expansion. There's a few cities we're looking at, you know, Indianapolis is one of them. And, you know, we've got a few shortlisted and starting to look at those cities. Really want to enter the US, still lots more homework to do, but been talking to some great capital partners there and excited to, to expand south of the border and continue to, to grow in Canada. I think there's going to be a huge opportunity for companies like ours. I think we're back in the game. You know, when when interest rates were at 2%, you know, one of my business partners, really smart guy, Blair Temlin, he he said, I called him one day and he said, you know, the last 10 years, he said, a lot of people made money in real estate and a lot of smart people made a lot of money. So, the next 10 years, smart people will make some money and the others will get wiped off the map. 
And I think he's probably right. Some people don't have much of a strategy, you know? And so it's funny, like the real estate business is it's an old and I'll call it fairly simple business, you know, fix the building, collect the rent. We've made it much more complex, but I really enjoy that. And that's us getting to really build stakeholders in these communities and, and double down and get to know our customers and add value to those customers. You know, because I always say, yeah, fine, we're in real estate, we provide you know, a safe, clean place and, and a roof over someone's head. But if we take one more step to the sideline and say, well, that's one thing we do for the customer. What else can we do for the customer? Then you, you're actually not in the real estate business. You're just serving a customer and trying to add value to that customer. And we have to continue to think that broadly and that strategically about it. We're closing in on our time here. This has been really insightful. I'm just going to open it up to you plug anything that Vita is working on that you might want the listeners to know about, or you're a podcaster yourself, an author, anything that you're working on as well. I'll just open up to you. Yeah. Let me see. You talked about my podcast and, and look, I won't plug my books or anything like that, but, but what I will say is I do think no matter what business you're in, that company culture is the winning strategy. You know, and there's that saying, culture eats strategy for breakfast. I actually, actually don't even agree with that. I think that you have to be strategic about your culture and that's how you win. So, and you know, this is about finding the right, if you go back to sports and you, you compare it to sports, it's about recruiting the best team members and getting them playing well and you win the game of business. And I really believe in that. And so our, as much as I want to build an international brand and company and really impact people's lives, we can't do that without having an incredible culture and people that are very committed to what we're doing. There's this quote, none of us will build great companies. We'll lead incredible people who build great companies. And that's certainly something I subscribe to. And so, so we'll just continue to double down on culture. We just, we just came up with an internal survey and asked very progressive questions that most wouldn't have the cojones to maybe do, which is, you know, we, we've asked questions like, do you see, see, and we debated this, but this was a, what do you call it? Anonymous survey, which I don't like, but I think Jody and I, our uh, chief people culture officer debated and, and she was right in the end because we asked questions like, look, do you see yourself working here in two years? And so we wanted the real honest answer. How would you rate from one to five, the impact five being high, one being low that Vita has made on your mental health, your family life, your physical health? And, you know, our lowest score out of five was four on the mental health question. And we're really proud of that. And we still have work to do. So I really believe we're building world-class culture. I would put us up against any company in the world. And we have to continue. That also means we can't get lazy about it. You know, when you think you're doing incredible, you, you have to go back to the drawing board then, not when you're in the, the shitter like I did with my security company. That was a big lesson is go back to the drawing board when things are good. Otherwise, you get lazy. So yeah, I probably end with that little mic drop. <laughs> That's great advice, everyone out there. Well, Ron, thank you so much again for joining us today. I'm looking forward to doing this again sometime in the near future. For all the listeners out there, make sure to check out Vita, their Instagram, their YouTube. They have great social media content that really amplifies their community building. Check out Ron's podcast, Scaling Culture, if you want to learn more about how to really build up internal culture and a brand. So we'll end with that. Thank you again, Ron. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. All right. Have a great day, everyone. You've reached the end of another episode of Sink or Swim. Make sure to visit us at rentsync.com forward slash podcast to access show notes, key takeaways, and where you can sign up to our newsletter to receive free bonus content. If you found value in the show, please also remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Thanks for listening.